Hello, I'm Alma Schneider. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the proud mother of four children, one of whom has Prader Willi syndrome. And I am Iris Miller. I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor and the proud mother of two children, one of whom has quadriplegic cerebral palsy and is nonverbal. In this podcast, we discuss the uncensored truth about raising children with disabilities. Prepare to laugh, cry, and hopefully learn something new. This is Two Moms, No Fluff. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Moms, No Fluff, the podcast where we discuss the uncensored truth about raising kids with disabilities. I am Iris Miller, and I'm with my friend and partner, Alma Schneider. Hello, Alma. Hello, Iris. How are you doing today? I am very happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about the topic of the day. Great. Well, today our topic is internalized ableism. So yes, even though Iris and I are staunch advocates for people with disabilities, our children with disabilities, we too are not immune to internalized ableism because let's face it, we grew up with it. We grew up with so much ableism that it's hard not to to have it in ourselves, but The key with all kinds of internalized isms is to be conscious of it and to fight it um, at every turn and, you know, to own it, to admit that we have it as well. Because if we don't admit it, we're not going to be able to address it and deal with it to make the world the perfect place that is our plan. You know, our plan is to change the entire world with our podcast, you know. So um, maybe I will start with... um, you know, we, we've mentioned it a little bit in some other episodes about our own experiences with the disability community. And this is kind of where the internalized ableism comes from, that um, I'll, I'll just start with when I was very, very little, there was only one girl in my neighborhood that I knew of who had um, a disability. I believe she had Down syndrome. Um, it was either Down syndrome or some kind of an intellectual disability. I don't remember, but I just remember um, that she was the only one that I knew of in town that I'd seen around, and her mother just seemed kind of downtrodden. And fast forward, that was something that I was deathly afraid of when Lincoln was born, that I would become someone that people would see as uh, a, a person who kind of people felt sorry for, or that um, that I looked kind of haggard and tired, not attractive, kind of schlumpy, and that was my very first experience, I think, with 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 someone who had a disability that I had thoughts and feelings about. So I'll start there. Yeah, Alma, I empathize with the story. And something um, I already shared with you is that in my childhood in the town of Herzliya in Israel, in order to get from our neighborhood to the children's scouts in Israel, we had to go by um, what's called, it used to be called the Welt. I can't, I can't butcher the name now in Hebrew, but never mind. It was an institute in which, uh, like a closed, confined institute <clears throat> for adults with um, developmental disabilities. And uh, my kind of interaction with adults with disabilities as a child was that um, place. And my memory of us going to the scouts as children in little groups of uh, three or four and being called by the people that were behind the fence there. They were reaching out their hands and they would call us, uh, children, children, come here, come here. They uh, Now I know that uh, people with uh, Down syndrome and other disabilities are so friendly. They just wanted the interaction. But <clears throat> we concluded because they were behind the fence that they were a danger to us. Mm. And we proceeded by always running away like crazy, you know, trying to escape. And I, that kind of memory of, you know, the fear mm-hmm. because they were behind the fence, the fear because they looked in a way that was different than other people that I knew or saw on the street. Mm-hmm. I, 
connected the looks with danger. And now after all that uh, I've been through with my own daughter, <clears throat> I find it, sorry, very, th this is I think why I'm kind of coughing. It's hard to say, but the first thing that happened when uh, my daughter was born is I looked at her face to check that she does not have Down syndrome, which is so ridiculous to me right now because I know so many beautiful people with Down syndrome that are so amazing and so inspirational and kind and loving and also smart because you can teach a person with Down syndrome so much. I just think about all the potential that was locked there behind the fence. Mm -hmm. But th this this was uh, my life and, and my experience and my greatest fear. Mm -hmm. um, and as I kind of uh, go through life right now, I also kind of try and stop at those points in time that I feel the biases, that I feel that I am being, you know, an ableist. Yeah. And I try to admit it. And I would share some of those things that I'm going through even today with you later on in the episode. <laughs> yeah, um, that really resonates. And it's so damaging just to be a, you know, to think that you were afraid of people that you were, you know, not, nobody talked about it. You know, nobody talked about disability. I don't remember anybody ever talking about disability when I was younger, growing up. Um, the next thing, memory that I have is, um, and I uh, remember talking about this with you at another point, was in um, that I didn't even know that there were people with disabilities in my school, in junior high school. Um, to start, we had zero people in my elementary school, zero people that I can think of. I'm sure that there were some issues, maybe invisible disabilities, but there wasn't a single person that I could point to in my mind's eye who had a disability in junior in elementary school. So moving on to junior high school, um, there were people that I only saw, I believe one time who were out on the playground that I later found out were in the basement, that there was an entire um, group of kids who had disabilities. And I don't know what the disabilities were, but they were in the basement at my school where I went every day for two years. And I had no idea, but I did see them on the playground one day. And I just remember the feeling of, you know, those kids, those kids, as opposed to, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't afraid of them and I wasn't mean to them or had negative thoughts about them, but I just remembered that they had nothing to do with my life. Like I had zero familiarity with people who were um, behaving differently. They were just, um, you know, I think that the word that we all learned, oh, they're retarded. Like that was the term that was used. Oh, they're mentally retarded. And I don't remember it being something, you know, it wasn't something we made fun of or anything like that. And I was always a very sensitive kid. It was never about bullying them or feeling, it was more just that I had absolutely nothing to do with them. And no, you know, if I think about it, I wouldn't have known how to relate to them at all because they, it was like a far, it was like somebody was an alien because there was zero experience with people. And it's just, you know, it just, reminds me of how vitally important it is for people with disabilities to be included with kids starting from a very young age so there isn't that that lack of familiarity which can breed fear you know when we're not familiar with something we're afraid because we don't know what what maybe they could lash out at us maybe they could do something to us if you're not exposed to people who have you know different behaviors than we do there is the risk of us feeling like they're, you know, forget about being afraid of them, having them in our lives in any way, even to invite them over for a play date, like that never would have crossed my mind at that point. So that's another example of, um, you know, something that I think was a lasting impression um, that I had, and then I'll get to high school when, when you're done with your next one. Yeah. Go ahead. I you know what, Alma, this is uh, so important. And I think that uh, integration, true integration and inclusion of children from the youngest ages onward, mm -hmm. not in a separate classroom, but in a typical classroom with the supports that they need to, uh, you called it push in, right? To yes. bring the services to the classroom, to mm -hmm. use 
the able-bodied children to support cognitive and physical and emotional development of children with disabilities will create such a better society in general if we only did that. And it's not just exposure, it's literally learning how to help because all of the children would one day have elderly parents that they'll have to help and care for. Mm -hmm. And we all hope to live to a, you know, advanced age when we lose abilities. And we yeah. would hope that our children themselves would be able to care for us. This is where it begins. This is where it all begins. And in some societies, caregiving is more accepted. And mm -hmm. uh, I hope, I hope that we can slowly move forward um, here in the US and create something that is just environmentally, I guess, better for everybody. So I think uh, that my experiences uh, with Karen, my daughter, uh, given that she had so many challenges with the uh, oral facial uh, control and ov obviously being that she's quadriplegic with <laughs> her muscles control in general, Feeding mm -hmm. her uh, always uh, either evoked a hypersensitive uh, swallow reflex, which would scare us to death because she will choke on her food, or mm -hmm. uh, we had to learn how to feed her without getting a tongue thrust. So you put food in her mouth and it <laughs> automatically comes out. So you feed, half comes out, some is getting swallowed, etc. Um, mm -hmm. Feeding her it was and still is a very messy business. But um, liquid aspiration is a big, big challenge um, and, and a risk. And also uh, getting dehydrated is a big challenge and a big risk. Mm -hmm. And I remember that we were trying for the longest, you know, to move away from a baby bottle and find another way to get her to drink that didn't include spilling a full cup of water <laughs> all over her outfit. And uh, Basically, I think that uh, it took me a few years kind of in her uh, toddler and early childhood years to overcome my <laughs> internal ableism and say, I couldn't care less about everybody else in the restaurant, maybe looking at us, judging us uh, and thinking to themselves, why are we still letting a seven-year-old drink from a baby bottle, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know that uh, it, it's kind of it's something small and something that might be almost self-explanatory to others, but this is my reality. I really struggled with it. I was embarrassed to just mm -hmm. like get the bottle out. And, and then I found that may, when we're in public, she doesn't drink enough because I, I tend not to offer the bottle because I don't want other to you know, look at us. Yeah. So it, it's those little things in which you know, society is not as ex accepting as we hope and that we are even faster to judge ourselves than society is. So yeah. that's a little thing that I have. And we still have that, you know, when we go out, we just went out to it yesterday, like my daughter is almost 15 and we still use a baby bib because uh, I challenge anybody else here to switch shirts and t-shirts and uh, sweaters every time after a meal because of all the food spills, etc. It's just extremely hard when someone is quadriplegic anyway to dress them up every day. So mm -hmm. we do the best that we can to keep the clothes clean and it includes, uh, unfortunately, usually very unsightly liquid repellent uh, bibs that I wish we never had to <laughs> use because they're not age appropriate and they're not um, fashionable in any way, but we need them and that's it. I think there's a lot of, of shame that we feel, and I brought this up before, but a therapist used the term, you know, when I started talking about this, right, when Lincoln was born, that there is a narcissistic injury when you have a child that is not quote unquote perfect and healthy, that there's something wrong with us. And of course we know intellectually that's, that that's not always the case. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, sometimes it, it's something hereditary, sometimes it's something um, uh, genetic that has to do with us. And even that is not our fault, but it's this idea that there is something wrong with us if there's something wrong with our child. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to admit that um, that they feel ashamed of their child because they feel that feeling that way means that they don't love their child. 
and they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, you can feel, have conflicted feelings, we all do, about, um, about disability. And a lot of it does come from our internalized ableism from society. But there is, we have to own that there is shame that we feel. There is, we don't want people uh, isolating us or we, we don't want to be isolated. We don't want to be abandoned. Nobody does. And so much of the um, not wanting to wear it on our sleeve that we have a child with a disability is that we want, we're also being protective of our children. We want them to fit in. Um, and that is a that is ableist because we, if we work, what we really need to be doing is work, we need to work really hard to have society allow our children to fit in. But because society is not where it needs to be in terms of inclusion, it kind of falls on us. And that's a lot to ask of a human being, of a single human being to be proud of, you know, people say, oh, March of the Disability Pride Parade. I never would have marched in a disability pride parade early on in my journey with, with Lincoln. I would have been mortified. Now I'm in a very different place. But the only reason that I've been able to address somewhat my internalized ableism is to uh, is that I put myself in situations where I found community so that I could feel the pride and the okayness of having a child with a disability because I was not alone and I wasn't going to be rejected and my son wasn't gonna be rejected by these other people that we um, have to keep working to fit in. And in those moments when we don't feel like we can fit in, we can feel safe and comfortable with, with our community. And I think that goes for any marginalized population. You need to have your, your quality time with your peeps who really get it uh, while working toward making the world more of an inclusive place. Um, I want to just bring up a little thing about high school that I think I've mentioned before about how there was only one person that I know of in my school who had autism and people treated him very poorly. Maybe some people were nice to him, but I saw some, some bullying going on making fun of him. And it was very disturbing to me. Um, I remember calling it out and I, I really didn't like it, obviously. And I certainly didn't participate in it and I called it out and I, but I remember again, it was one person and that was my understanding of autism back then. And I was just in high school and it was that, oh, this person is acting differently. They're acting, you know, not like everyone else and they're being made fun of. So definitely hit a chord, struck a chord in me that, wow, this is not a good thing to have. This autism thing is not a good thing to have because people will make fun of you. So I was left with that. Um, and I wanna you know, fast forward that kind of thinking to my, to my shame and embarrassment when Lincoln was born. I went out of my way. I didn't just not tell everybody what he had. I went out of my way to tell all my friends, don't tell anybody what he has. People are gonna ask you, don't tell them anything. Don't tell them anything. I was so terrified that, that he was going to be, that our family was going to be shunned in some way. And I look back on it, it's very painful for me to think about the fact that I was in that state that I, it's also, again, it brings up the idea of privacy versus shame. You don't want everybody knowing your business. You don't want everybody knowing your business until you've had a time to process it. And that really was where I was. But I admit there was definitely an element of shame in there and um, fear of people pitying me because I guess I pitied other people, you know, who were experiencing that. So it was a real eye-opening experience for me to have gone through that. And I'm, I'm glad to say that I've moved forward, but it took a very long time and it took a lot of support from other parents who made me feel like, okay, this is not something to be ashamed of. And we have to work hard to make sure that other people aren't ashamed of having a child with a disability. Right, Alma, okay. First of all, I loved everything you just said and shared. And uh, I really, really <laughs> hope that uh, there are uh, younger parents that are listening to this episode and um, 
there is something to be said about, you know, life maybe as a boxing match. If you were just hitting the chest and you're on the floor trying to grasp some air, if there's a coach on the side that is telling you, punch them on the left, punch them on the right, you can't hear it. You are trying to recover. And mm -hmm. at that point in time, it is very, very hard to interact with society mm -hmm. because of all the societal discrimination yes. against people with disabilities yes. and ableism in general. Yes. So I totally, totally get it. And um, I think that there, there is no parent that gets the news about their child having a disability that doesn't have this period of like just you know, grasping for air on the floor, kind of in a, I don't know, embryo position, uh, mm -hmm. trying to digest something that is impossible to, to understand sometimes. There is, a, again, I would say no parents that ever wish on their child to have a disability. It's just, uh, it's, it's hard. And sometimes given as we go through this disability life, we discover all the beauty that is in the situation, but there is a ton of hardship. And most of the hardship is uh, maybe bringing me to my next point, which is uh, I used to work as a rehabilitation counselor uh, in the Disability 4 program in California in San Diego State University and working with uh, a lot of uh, students with disabilities. And I remember as a young professional, before I had my daughter, even though I had a master's of science in rehabilitation counseling and enough kind of education behind me, that I would judge some of the people that I was providing services for, for their lack of social skills. Mm -hmm. And today this is mind boggling to me, right? And I would say, uh, this is such a shame that schools and other programs don't make enough effort to you know expose them to more social situations so they better know how to navigate simple kind of day-to-day -day realities or routines and uh, I thought to myself if I ever had a child with a disability I would make sure that they're fully integrated into society and have enough experiences so they don't become socially awkward like some of the people I worked with. Not all of them, but some of them. Enough for me to be judgmental and develop this opinion, right? Little did I know that me wanting to have my daughter included in so many social activities and uh, be a part of the children's, uh, I guess, general day-to-day -day life was nice enough, but society was not ready for us. And many, many, many times we would go to events, we would be there, but nobody would interact with her. Nobody would like be less than terrified to come closer and say something beyond, that's a nice dog, okay, <laughs> about the service dog, ignoring my daughter altogether. So I was personally, now I can admit, judging people with disabilities when I was supposed to judge society. Mm -hmm. We are not giving those children who later become adults seeking equal opportunity in employment because they have the university degrees. They are fully qualified to take those positions. The mm -hmm. one thing that is lacking is that they did not get enough social experiences. And it's because of us keeping the doors shut. And mm -hmm. I hope that, um, that we can change that. We need to change that. Yeah. And, and that goes to um, back to education, again, making sure that, that there is a diverse group in classes so that everybody can learn from each other and be familiar with, with people with disabilities so as not to be afraid, so as not to say, oh, no, that's too much for us to deal with. Um, we can't do that. And I think that that is something that happens quite a bit in the education system. So for example, as a parent, I know that I have had experiences where, and I hear this all the time from other families, that um, we, we, we don't even think twice when a, a, a so-called professional tells us, oh, this program will be better for our kids, for your child, because um, they will have more, um, your, you know, your child has certain behaviors that, you know, he'll suffer for, you know, because of those behaviors, he won't be able to learn as well. 
So he really needs to go into a self-contained class or he'll, he'll need to, uh, or she'll need to um, be pulled out of the class to learn. And I think that for us and our internalized ableism, we say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't want my child to disrupt the other students. That's gonna be, you know, that's gonna be a problem for me if, if they disrupt the other students. The truth is, that there need to be supports put in place so that um, that those kinds of behaviors that could potentially be distracting to other students are dealt with in a productive way so that everyone can can learn to the best of their ability and be successful. I think that we're so quickly deterred from being included because we're afraid of having our kids stand out. In, in what we see as a negative you know, way that might make them and our family more socially isolated, as opposed to saying, no, this is my child's right and it's your job to be in this class and it is your job as the public education system to provide the support so that my child can be integrated. But we, it, it's very, you know, I see this a lot and I see it with myself, not for contained class for my son because that wasn't, offered to him, but had they told me, um, had I been told, for example, in preschool that I had the option to have my son in the regular preschool, I would have opted for that in two seconds. I just assumed because they put him in a special needs pre-K that that was where he had to go. So it's another example of you don't know what you don't know, which is, again, why it's so very important to be part of a community of parents of kids with disabilities to learn things you know that you just simply might not know i didn't know that it was within my rights to have my child go to, to a different program i didn't even know but had i been told that i might have said i might have gone along with what they recommended saying oh but he should really be in the special needs pre-k because he's going to get a lot more more individual attention i probably would have gone with that because of my own internalized ableism, like, oh, he's going to be too different from the other students, he's going to stand out. But that's a form of internalized ableism, because we're not saying it's my right, it's his right to be in a, in a more inclusive setting, and it's your job to make it easier for him to be successful in that arena. Our go-to is often, oh, you know, Let's, you know, if he's going to have these behaviors, I don't want, you know, I, I don't want, uh, I don't want other people to see it or to be in a difficult situation with that. So, you know, I'm saying a lot of different things here, but the bottom line is that, that um, we don't know what we don't know. So it's important to find out from other people. And that will help, I think, with, with advocating for our kids instead of feeling like, oh, you know, he's, he's different or she's different. And we have to focus on the the deficits instead of the strengths, because in those inclusive settings, the strengths will be more strengthened. And it's, it is best for our children to be in those settings and um, to, for the other children there to be exposed to people who are different and to, to accept them in their, with their differences. Yeah, you know, Alma, I want to piggyback on your kind of <laughs> last few sentences. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, to kind of say to head of the game, I'm going to put myself now in front of a line of fire and okay. I'm actually asking our listeners to, to share their comments and thoughts about this because this is quite a moral dilemma. But mm -hmm. as we're talking about ableism, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to share with you an experience that I had in which I was like as ableist as one can be. <laughs> I, I admit <laughs> fully, um, I just... Uh, I am not sure how how to you know take this situation and what other people's uh, thoughts and feelings are around that, and um, I want to like kind of in the name of inclusion and all that, uh, I want to make theater inclusive for all. It's very important to me. Both my kids love uh, performing arts. However, in one of those performances that uh, Broadway performances that we went to, um, we uh, were obviously sitting in the accessible area. So mm -hmm. next to us, there was another family with a young adult that was extremely vocal. 
And two things happened as a result of sitting there next to uh, that family. Uh, first of all, uh, for us, and I'm sure for all the other guests to like a, a Broadway performance like that, it's a very, very expensive endeavor to, to go, especially if you have to drive long distances and the, the tickets uh, are expensive, expensive, as we all know. And having someone constantly vocalize very, uh, uh, how do you say, with high high volume, high pitch, in way, in a way that kind of interrupts you from hearing what is said on the stage, was was quite like a obnoxious. I don't know how to say it. As understanding as I am to people with disabilities, I felt that our uh, enjoyment, and I'm sure at least three rows down, if not behind, were also interrupted by all the vocalization and noises. So um, I, I felt that that was like, all I can remember from that musical is the constant interruption and how frustrating it was to kind of miss what were they just saying on stage, etc. And also the feeling of shame and embarrassment, I'll say it bluntly like that, Alma, that we were sitting next to them and that people might think that our children, specifically my daughter, who seems on surface to be way more disabled than that person was, and that people would at the end of the show, as they always do going beside us, you know, as they come out looking at all the equipment, the dog, the chair, etc., would think that this entire show was interrupted because of my child. Mm -hmm. And I don't quite know what is the correct conclusion. I know that so many venues now have uh, sensory friendly performances that can resolve that, you know, challenge. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear comments from our listeners as I'm learning as we go from others that participate and care, but uh, I assume and I know that that individual deserves to enjoy a musical like my kids do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that all the other people that purchase tickets to that performance also have the right to uh, get like a, a user-friendly environment where they are seeing a show not being constantly interrupted. I don't know what's your take about that. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated issue, and it sort of reminds me of of when somebody has a baby and they bring them to different events. I mean, I remember I brought my baby twenty two years ago to a movie theater because normally she slept during the movie, and one day she was crying like crazy, and I didn't leave the theater, and I should have, and somebody yelled at me. <laughs> and the, yeah. and I, you know what? When there's a crying baby, I always feel people should get up and leave. You know, they should walk outside. They, unfortunately, they're going to have to miss part of it. It's a tough one when it's someone who has a disability who's older. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a fine line, I guess, with um, having to take responsibility for that and thinking about other people. You know, and how much it's it's affecting the experience of the other people. It's an interesting conundrum and I would like to hear what people have to say about it who do have children who vocalize a lot in in public places you know where people are trying to hear what's going on it's a really good point I know that at our synagogue there's someone who vocalizes periodically and nobody pays any attention to it it's you know a periodic high-pitched yell and everybody's used to it um but if it were something that was ongoing throughout the entire performance over and over again to the point where you people couldn't hear. I think that that is, I think it's a situation by situation, uh, situation <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, you know, when it's really taking over the experience, but, you know, I'd like to hear from other people. I don't want to, you know, I guess I can speak to that as an audience member, but not as a parent. So I'd be curious. I'd be curious to know what people think, but, you know, those are just some of our stories about, our internalized ableism and how we have to keep it in check. And we have to remember that when we're embarrassed about something that has to do with our kid, we need to really think about it. Is it about my kid or is this about society? And how much am I taking on what I've learned over my life about shame and feeling sorry for people and things like that? And really keeping our eyes on the prize of 
what is best for my child and society and for people going forward who are going to be having kids with disabilities? What do we want our world to look like? And I always bring up the idea of I'm not going to be a martyr for inclusion when it comes to my own kid. And I really followed that, but I've really pushed um, being a martyr for inclusion in a lot of ways because I feel that it's important, but there does come a point where the world is not ready for us yet. And um, sometimes we just have to make our own kid's world a little bit more uh, safe and happy. And that might mean not being in, in exclusively inclusive settings. So that's all I have to say. I don't know about you, Iris. Anything else you want to add besides... Uh, no, I'm really hoping that people would share their experiences and uh, perspective and thoughts, especially about uh, that moral dilemma <laughs> I just mentioned. And uh, thank you, Alma, again, for sharing your stories and experience and wisdom with all of us. I always learn something yes. from you. I and, always learn from you as well. And <laughs> I appreciate you and all your stories. <laughs> I'm looking forward to recording another episode soon. And until then, we'll see everybody next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating so that other people can hear this podcast. It'll reach more people with reviews and ratings, but only five-star ratings. We don't want to need zeros or ones. <laughs> Alma, thank you very much. See you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. For more information, please go to www.twomomsnofluff.com. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give it a five-star rating so more people can hear it. Thank you.